the book of First Corinthians, chapter number three, and I'm going to read uh, just verses uh, 16 through 23. And when you're in the Word, let me know by saying I'm in the Word. That is once again the book of First Corinthians, chapter number three, and I, uh, I'm going to start at verse number 16, and I'll end at verse number 23. And when you're there, if you just let me know by saying I'm in the Word. Amen. 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 Y'all in the Word. In the Word. Y'all said I'm in the Word. Y'all, y'all just trying to get me to go out there. Y'all. All right. I'm gonna, we're gonna move. And it reads, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, which is what you are. Guard against self-deception, each of you. If someone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this age is foolishness with God. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the, that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then no more boasting about mere mortals, for everything belongs to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, everything belongs to you. And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. You may be seated. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you, God, even for what you're doing in your people right now who are your seed, who you say belong, God, to you. So, God, we bless you right now for every great gift that you're going to sow into your people today. God, we pray right now for a receptive spirit that our eyes will be open, our hearts will be inclined to hear, that our feet will be ready to move in the direction and under the instruction that you're going to give us. Bless us right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we take a look at this, we'll find out that Paul is talking to this First Corinthian, well, to this Corinthian church here in this book of First Corinthians. He's talking to the church early on about some different principles here. One of the things that he talks about is their carnality. He's talking about them being carnal Christians. Those, uh, I, I preached about this on the telecast this morning, but he talked about the fact that the, the evidence of them being carnal Christians not that they were the, the natural man, the unsaved or the unregenerated man, but they were also not the spiritual man that's spoken of in chapter 2. In chapter 2, you look at verses 14 through 16, you will see that Paul begins to give it an explanation of what it is to be a spiritual man. To be a spiritual man is to know the things of the spirit or the things of God. The, the natural man, it says he cannot understand the very revelations that come from God. It's not in him. He has the mind that he possessed. From his very birth, birth that's born in sin and shaped even in iniquity, that works at a place that is absolutely at enmity with God. But when you begin to see that he talks about the spiritual man, the spiritual man is able to discern the things of God. And in verse 16 in chapter 2, the last thing he says is, but we have the mind of Christ. So with the mind of Christ, we can see things through the perspective of Jesus Christ himself. Now Paul begins to talk now in this third chapter, and he's talking about this third group of carnal believers. He said, I couldn't even talk to you as spiritual, because I can see that I tried to, I fed you with milk, but I see you're still at the milk stage. I couldn't even give you me. I couldn't amplify the revelation that God really has for you because you weren't even ready to bear it. So now Paul begins to talk about how dangerous carnality is in for a believer. It is that that believer is still going to heaven. It does not mean that believer is unsaved. It simply means that that believer is going to walk way below the very things that God has for them. Way below the inheritance that God has. Way below the level of revelation that God wants to give. That once you know about Jesus when you first get saved, you got to know that the same Jesus stays the same, but he's sweeter every year. So that there's revelation that we miss. So that even though God talks about power, what power you had when you first knew him, there's another level of power that when you understand who God really is and begin to understand who you are, even though the word is still the same, the same power, it begins to duplicate and amplify, and it looks different this year than it looked before. You had power in your mouth before, but you couldn't speak because you didn't understand spiritual things. But there's a point of growth that's supposed to happen when you understand spiritual things, you begin to see stuff that other folk don't see. Other people see a problem, you see an opportunity. Other people see the devil, and you see God. You begin to look and they start moaning and groaning and then you are praising because you see, I'm seeing through the light of the spirit. Last time, I had my carnal mind and everything, something happened, I said, why me? But this time, through the spiritual mind, I begin to say, God, I see what you're doing in this situation and I'm not, I, now I'm able to even praise you for what used to look like calamity. 
so that I have a spiritual mind now. But Paul begins to talk about the other problem with carnality. He says, here's a couple things I need you to understand. That you are co-workers belonging to God. That you are God's field and that you are his building. Now then he says, Paul says, now I want you to understand that according to the grace of God that was given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, but someone else is going to build on that foundation. But each one must be careful how he builds upon that foundation. Because Paul said, now there's a foundation that's already laid. For no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul says, now the church is already founded on Jesus Christ. So there's not going to be new revelation as it pertains to who Jesus Christ is. It's going to be deeper revelation, but Jesus Christ and him crucified is what Paul said, listen, I don't preach anything else. Yet when you see this book, you see a whole bunch of other stuff. But what Paul begins to reveal to us is that you can preach Jesus Christ and him crucified and then come back later and say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And you realize that's the same Jesus Christ, him crucified. When you begin to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified, it's just his death, burial, and resurrection when you first began. But then when you realize that you're the head and not the tail, and that literally uh, that, that God begins to talk about this transformation, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. So your beginning of John 3.16, for God so loved the world, it starts out on one thing that I love him because he first loved me. But then it begins to be amplified when I understand love is powerful. Love is meant to overcome enemies. So at first when I begin to talk about love, I I just said God rocked me to sleep. But now when I understand love, I understand love is powerful. It'll break chains in my family. It'll break generational curses. That I have the ability to love some people out of some problems that they have. So now I understand love. So Paul said, now, but be careful how you build this foundation. Be careful what you start telling people. Be, be careful what you start espousing as doctrine. Because Paul said, don't you understand that you are God's temple? Do you understand that the Spirit of God lives in you, and if someone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him? Because God's temple is holy, which is what you are. So now let me tell you what, what, you, what you're seeing here. God says a couple things here. He says, uh, don't you understand who you are? And now, now he's not talking about just you individually. He's talking about collectively. It matters how you deal with God's house. It matters how you deal with his temple. Because God has said, I place an organi organism, not an organization, but a living organism in the earth called the church that was birthed by me, that is alive, and I built it, and I laid a foundation that is built on this church, that upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So it's got some properties in it for the church to fight for itself. But I want you to understand, here's what God says, it can be destroyed. Now, the church itself universally cannot be destroyed, but individual bodies can absolutely be destroyed. And what you will find here is that Paul said, I know that you're carnal, and I can tell that they're carnal Christians operating the church, and the way I'll tell is by division. The way I'll tell is by strife. The way I'll be able to tell is by envy. And you will find out that the church is not destroyed by the devil. That he does not say that if the devil comes to destroy the church, I'm going to destroy him. No, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That means if the church dies, it's going to die from the inside out. Right. That means that God is saying the enemy that will destroy the church is going to be the people that are wolves in sheep's clothing. It's going to be the carnal Christians even that infiltrate the church that are trying to build a doctrine around themselves. There are people who promote themselves. There are people who exalt themselves. People who walk in pride and they are going to be the destruction of God's houses. There are people right now that are operating in such pride that churches are being destroyed. Churches are closing down and ain't because of Money. They're breaking up not because there's not enough people in the choir, not because there's not enough folk to be able to do the church business. They're breaking up because people are coming into the house that are not about God's business. They're about their business. They're about promoting themselves. They come in here because they want to preach an engagement. They want somebody to say how awesome they are. They don't care about the spirit of God. They're not coming in here to get changed. So they're coming in here one way and leaving the same way, but leaving that way for decades. So you can have churches that are carnal, 
with people that have refused to transform. All right. That refuse to change. And God says, let me tell you this. It doesn't, it's not just singular. It's not just you. He says, this group of people are the one group of people that he named to have the ability to destroy the church. Because they're deceptive. They're crafty. Because they do know who Jesus is, but they don't have his mindset. So that means they're going to deal with stuff the way they deal with stuff. That means that there's going to be strife everywhere they go. There are folk that move from church to church and they don't put nothing but a tornado and a tsunami everywhere they go. They just go from church to church and mess up people's auxiliaries. And before you know it, after they destroy one church, they go to another church with that same lie, with that same strife, with that same envy, with that same self-promotion. And when folk find them out over there and they can run up out of that place, they run to another place where they can go and destroy that place. But I want you to know that God said, I know how to defend my church and my my people. I am the good shepherd and I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to destroy some people who are trying to destroy my church. It's dangerous to play with this thing. It's dangerous to get in people's ear and try to break down leadership. It's dangerous to come at the church and get in somebody's ear and start talking about other people's members. God didn't say, listen, I'm protecting the pastor of the church. He didn't say that. He said, listen, if you destroy any one of the sheep in here, that means that you, you act like the devil. I'm going to deal with you just like you are a devil. That even though you may not go to hell, I'm not saying that I'm going to throw you in hell. I'm saying there's some stuff that you're trying to do that I'm going to break down. There's some gifts that you have that are going to stay dormant. There's some anointings that you have that you don't even qualify for anymore. Because we don't want what God wants. So he says, guard against self-deception. When you begin to self-flatter yourself, when you understand, when, when church becomes, please tell me how nice I am. Please tell me how awesome I am. Let me tell you something. If you don't want no sandpaper, you don't need to be in here. If you ain't got no rough edges that you want God to take off, you don't need to be here. He said, listen, I came for those that were sick. And if you think that you so well, you need to go ahead and stay out there because you're in heaven already. But God says, I came for those that were in need of a physician. And he's talking about people that have a mindset that know, God, I'm torn from the floor. I know me. I'm under no delusion about who I am. Y'all might think I'm awesome, but I am not eluded by the real me. And I know the real me. And when I come to the church, I don't come for people. I come to Jesus because he's the only one that can help me. I've already tried people and I've already tried me and I know how to talk to myself but I can't talk myself out of the mess that I'm in so I come to Jesus. So Jesus is talking about you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. Don't think that you're more highly of yourself than you ought to because what it does, it keeps you from coming to get fixed. The altar calls and the altar ought to be full. But you know what? Some of us are so anointed and so powerful that we're going to do it at home. Some of us are just so wonderful and so fearfully and wonderfully made that we miss the doctor's office. But I'm going to tell you something. You know how you stay wonderful? Every time the doctor is in, you better be in his office. Every time God says, if anybody bleeds in here, you ought to be the first one. And say, God, that nobody else may not see it. But I'm bleeding from places that nobody knows about. I'm still cut from stuff that happened years ago. And God, the reason I act the way I act is because of the problems that I have. But I've come to see a physician that can fix the stuff that mama can't even handle. There's some stuff daddy can't deal with. I don't care how sweet your honey bunny really is. Your wife or your husband is not equipped to deal with the things of your soul. You don't need a husband, you need a word. You don't need a friend, you need a word. You don't need some more money, you need a word. You don't need to get the prophecy, you don't need more anointing, you need a word from God. So he said, but listen, go on against that because listen, there's some folks that are wise in their own age. There's some people right now that's trying to figure it out themselves. And depression comes because we're trying to work a destiny we don't know nothing about. You don't even know where God's trying to take you. So how are you going to get there? You don't even know the road he's going to put you on. So how are you going to walk it? You need to be able to get a word behind your ear saying, this is the way, and walk you in it. Because there's some people who know right now, God, I never expected you to do me like you're doing me right now. I never expect you to bless me like you're blessing me right now. If you had told me 10 years ago, I'd be right here. I'm telling, I'm telling somebody's testimony in here right now. God, I never expected to be singing on praise and worship. I never expected for you to give me a ministry. I never expected for you to inhabit my dream. And my vision. I never expected for you to.
call me a prophet or an evangelist. I never expected you to touch me the way you touch me. But God, if I told somebody that you'd be sweeter than a honeycomb 15 years ago when I was out there doing everything I knew how to do, I never would have believed it. So God, I'm going to lean on you because you're taking me places I never expected to go. There's some people who have had a worship experience this week that say, God, I never expected to go out there. And you know what it is? It's when you humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. He says, I'm going to exalt you in due season. And the believer has the ability to stay on the launching pad until God lights the flame. And you know what's so hard is that when you are anointed and you know it, and God says, not yet. And you don't even realize that your silence and your waiting is as big a part of your ministry as its manifestation. The God says they're not going to watch you when you do your thing. They watch you how you wait. They're going to read the book because of how you waited, not because of what you did. You ain't the only one that's going to do what you're doing. But everybody don't know how to wait on the Lord. Everybody who's anointed can preach the word of God. They can go out there and be the businesswoman or the businessman that God called them to be. But everybody don't know how to wait on the Lord. And waiting on the Lord is a thing that only God can give you. There's some people that don't know God that are millionaires, but only those who have the spirit of God that know how to wait on the Lord. Oh, y'all need, need to begin to praise God right there because there's some people that are walking in an anointing right now that God said that you're waiting. And the power is in your ability to wait. The power is in your ability to be humble. The power is in your ability to humble yourself because I already told you I give grace to the humble and I resist the proud. So there are people that God is speaking of here that are dealing with the wisdom of this age. They were, they were trying to to gather things of God based upon the wisdom of this age. Based upon the way, this is the way it's got to be done. This is the way that God's going to move me. I, I know how he operates. And God says, you don't know me like that. You don't know how I'm going to operate with you. You don't know how I'm going to get you there. But your praise is because you know I'm going to get you there. Unto him that is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless. That's what the praise is about. God, I'm going I'm, I'm to get out of the, the God business. I'm going to get out of the destiny business. I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to get out of the predestination business. I'm just going to start praising because I know the end. I know the end of it that you're going to keep me from falling and then you're going to present me faultless. So God, everything that I'm going through right now, you already promised that you're going to make sure that whatever tripping I do, that I'm not going to trip enough to fall out of your hand and that you're going to present me in a way that I don't even look. Faultless. But here's what God said. No more boasting about men. I mean, let me tell you something. We are guilty in the church of making God's anointed people superstars. We're guilty. And idolatry is so near this that's why it's so dangerous. That we have lifted up people to such an extent that we will go see people before we go see God. That we get so angry with people who tell you who are a believer to pray. You send believers back to prayer, they look right at you like, but that's what I came to you for. So you don't want, so you came to see me, you didn't really come to see God. And you're gonna get mad at me because I sent you to the Lord. You came to see Bishop Jakes, didn't you? But you didn't mention one time that you came to see the Spirit fall. I know, you spent all that money. You bought every DVD you could get. You got every single you could get. And you didn't do it because you wanted the Spirit of the Lord to fall. You like the way they sound. And God said, listen, stop worshiping people. Respect people. Revere people, but stop worshiping people. Stop praising people and start praising God. Because guess what happens? What happens when you can't get the person? There's a hotline for those who know that can always get to God. What happens when the person is not feeling you that day? And you better get it in your spirit. They ain't going to feel you every day. They're not going to want to put up with you every day. And every call, and because somebody in business, sometimes people don't want to talk to you. But I know a man who will talk to you 24-7, and his name is Jesus. How dare you lift up an apostle above the man who is named above every name? And every now and then, God will move some people from us. I called them and they didn't call me back. And God said, shame on you for not calling me. <laughs> I emailed 
him seven days ago and he never emailed me back. And God said, listen, had you shot me one email today, you'd have had an answer back in a second. And I would have bid you to come before the throne of grace, ask me what you will. And as a matter of fact, the reason I didn't let you come in last time, because you came in here sneaking in here like a thief and a robber. But if you know who you are, then you'll come boldly before the throne and ask me what you will. All I need to hear is a little faith. And you can't have the faith of him. You better get your own faith. So you so mad looking at the folk. God, why are you doing this for them? They're walking in their faith. And you trying to walk in their faith. They before God. And you think because they went before God, that means you went before God. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. You better get the face of God. Listen, as long as you want secondhand news, that's cool. I won't buy it straight off the press. As long as you want to get it from somebody else, that's cool. As for me, I want to get my stuff directly from God. If, there, if, if there's a need for a middleman, I'll take it. But I heard the word of God say something totally different. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. So God under the shadow of the Almighty. I ain't running from you. I'm getting covered by God. I'm being empowered by God. Do you understand what happens when you begin to get connected in the secret place? God said the problem is you stay down here. You're at this altar, but you don't know how to come up into the secret place. The altar is just a door to get you to the secret place of God. Don't nothing happen right here. It happens in the spirit. And you can come to the altar 24-7. You can build a tent right there 24-7. And I can promise you, you're going to be just like you were. But when you get out your tent and get under God's covering, Stuff's going to change. And there's some people right now that's been wondering, God, how come nothing's happening? How come there's no change? God says, you're still in the same place. And I'm not talking to you down there anymore. I'm not ministering to you in the outer courts anymore. You're still to be grown now. You're still dealing with milk. And it's meat time. I'm trying to get you on another diet. Your taste buds ain't ready for the real thing. Because you're so used to junk, you don't even want the real thing. Well, I'm not offering you anything else but the real thing now. Now, go up and be somebody. Go up and walk in the anointing that I give you. Stop telling everybody how powerful you are and exhibit some power. I'm going to bring some folk that's going to push you. Now, if you really all that, don't push back. I'm going to bring some folk that's going to say some crazy stuff to you. You really all that. Get down on your knees and start praying. All right. Uh, don't pray against them. Pray for it. Pray a blessing in their life. See, I'm, I'm a challenge. And God says, if you're really spiritual, spiritual ain't how you sing. Spiritual ain't how you lift up your hand. Anybody can imitate that. Spiritual is how you deal with your enemy. Spiritual is how your relationships operate. Time out for people who are so powerful in the church and are horrible at home. Time out for people that are awesome in the church and they look just like the folk in the street. How come you ain't the same in acne that I see in Bible study? How come you don't carry yourself at McDonald's the same? Because you know she threw the money at you for you to bless her, not to cuss her out. <laughs> didn't, didn't you know that you were going to be disrespected? Didn't you know you're supposed to be disrespected like darkness have no fellowship? Do you understand that there's going to be enmity between you and the world? Yeah. You, you ain't nobody's friend out here. You're a peculiar person. When you was in the dark and nobody knew you, everybody was cool with you. But you ain't supposed to be cool with everybody. Everybody is supposed to like you, but you're supposed to be able to love everybody. That's the power of God. You mad at me, but I ain't mad at you. I'm going home and I'm sleeping sound because I was able to forgive you and put it to rest. Now I'm praying for you so you can go to sleep. So you ain't got to write that crazy letter that you're going to regret later. All right. That's the stuff that God is talking about. You better be careful. Uh huh. And then you have the nerve to bring that mindset back in here. Mm hmm. And poison the babes in Christ. Poison and pull away the believers. But here's what God said it's all yours. Now I want you to get that. He says it's all yours. Listen, you know what? I don't know what you was thinking about Apollos, because he's a pastor. I don't even know what you was thinking about Paul, because he's an apostle. 
But I sent you a apostle and a pastor, and they're all yours. I sent them here for you, and all the gifts, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Apollos, and I'm of this one. He said, they're all yours. I mean, everything in the kingdom, every gift is yours. I brought them here to give it to you. It's yours. There's work you don't even have to do. That's why they're here. Stop lifting the people up and get the gift that the people have. Stop cheering for everybody and receive the gift that they're supposed to bring. There's revelation. That's why I brought them here. That's why they studied when you didn't have to study. That's why they labored when you didn't have to labor. So stop cheering for them and get the stuff they try to bring. Preachers are preaching liberty every week and people walk and I said, Lord, didn't he preach? With your shackles still on. Preaching and opening doors for us financially. And we said, whoa, that offering teacher was awesome. I'm going to keep giving like I was giving. And I'm going to keep sowing like I was sowing. And I'm going to keep buying as many braids as I can buy even though my rent ain't paid. And I'm going to still use the seed that God gave me for whatever I want. But I love that teacher. The, I mean, people that are so broken and bound have been to more seminars. that are going from service to service and from church to church. And after this service, there's 10 other services. And after they leave here, they're going there and no change. Because I'm not in the face of God, I'm in the face of people. I came to see a celebrity. I came because I heard she could preach. He could do this, but I never came to get Jesus. So I got this what I wanted. Goosebumps. But no change. Uh-huh. Shook my hand a little. Ooh. He did it. Felt great. Still went home and beat the kids up. Still went home and talked the same way. Still went home and made that call, and I ain't never speaking to you again. Didn't go home and reconcile. Didn't go home and fix nothing. Didn't feel the conviction of God. Just felt the kumbaya. And I'm going to leave here when the conviction gets too heavy so I can find some place to comfort me and encourage me. Mm. If there's too much rebuke, there's too much correction, that can't be the place for me. Because God's going to cover my mess. Now, you go going to have you travel in third class. God said, you're supposed to be traveling first class. That's right. You're supposed to get there, but you're supposed to get there first class. Not in the back of the bus. Not in coach. But it's all yours. And, and I want you to see what he says. He says, everything belongs to you. Whether Apollos, whether Paul, whether Cephas, whether the world, whether life, whether death. Do you understand the things in the now are for you? The things that are in the present are for you. But he said, listen, I'm going to make even death work for you. Death is not even a master anymore. Death is even a servant that will open a door by itself that will allow us to move into a place that has nothing but glory in it for us. Even death is yours. I've turned everything around and put it in your hands. It's time out for us acting like servants. So Paul said, listen, you belong to Christ. And Christ belongs to God. But all of this that you see, this is your inheritance. The peace of God is your inheritance. But you know what? The prosperity of God is your inheritance. Life right now is your inheritance. Don't look toward heaven. God says right now, there's an anointing operating in you right now that is not going to operate in the heaven because you ain't going to need it there. But right now, there's power that's supposed to come from us in this present. So that means that even in difficult situations, God says, you know what I'm saying, this up for you to emerge. This is your moment. This is your time. This is the time to get the inheritance right now. Because you know, if you see people who are wealthy and they have like multi-billions of dollars, you'll see that the child will get an inheritance at 21. And then they'll get another inheritance at 35. And then once that person dies, they'll get another inheritance. Do you know that God says, listen, I only count on a thousand hills. And I got an inheritance for y'all when you die. But some of y'all got a 21-year-old inheritance that, that's waiting in the bank for you right now. And some of y'all past that have got a 35-year-old inheritance that you waiting in the bank. And you don't even realize that you waiting to say, God, I can't wait till I get to heaven. God says, listen, hey, we can make this a little bit better right now. It ain't going to be heaven, but we can make it a little bit better right now. And I don't want you to wait because you can have it right now. But all of it is yours. 
Is anybody ready to get what God has for you? I mean, I'm serious. Is, is anybody really ready to begin to walk in something that God has said, listen, this is yours? I mean, I, I don't care what the situation looks like. I don't care what the circumstance is, is even surrounded by. I want you to understand that there's some stuff right now that you are supposed to grab hold of and that you're supposed to apprehend and that some of us have tasted of it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. You know that's Old Testament, right? You, you know that's the, that, that was the initial thing where he said, dip your finger in, but you don't own it. <laughs> You just get a little taste of it. God says, well, you know what now? The shift is in. Christ has died. He's now been resurrected. And he bought the whole land. And he's made you an heir to the land. So now you own it. He says, it's yours. So don't just taste and see. I want you to grab hold of the whole thing. There are ministries and there are gifts that are about to emerge today. That God says, listen, that's what's going to grab what you need. Because that's the gifts are going to make room for you and put you before a great man. So anybody here right now, that knows that this word was for you. Because if this word was for you, I want you to come to this altar right now because I want to pray with you. I mean, if you understand right now that God, I know you were talking to me, and I'm not, I'm not going to move you in any way. I just want you to know, God, God, I know you were talking to me, that you were speaking to me about an inheritance that you want me to have. That God, I know you were talking to me about the dormant and hidden anointing, and you want me to apprehend it. That God, that you've already spoken to me and told me that I've been talking about it and I've been hearing about it, but now is the season of apprehension. Now is the season where I'm going to apprehend him, everything that you have for me. That God, you've already laid a foundation in my life 